All right, everybody, are you ready to learn about the Minnesota DREAM Act? Um, it is, let's see, it is Tuesday, uh, the 2nd of, of November, and we are going to be talking about the Minnesota DREAM Act. And I just want to give a big shout out to Megan Flores, the Manager of State Financial Aid Programs at the Office of Higher Education. Thank you for uh, volunteering your time to lead this training. So we will hear from her in, in just a little bit, but first I wanna make sure that everyone on the line uh, knows a little bit more about Minnesota Goes to College. So my name is Kat Klima. I'm the Outreach and Communications Coordinator at the Minnesota Office of Higher Ed. I am joined here today uh, by Beth Barsness, who is the, yep, there she is. Thank you, Beth, uh, who is uh, an employee at the Minnesota Department of Education. We are co-chairs to Minnesota Goes to College, which is essentially uh, Minnesota's college going initiative. So we are comprised of this steering committee. So there's a, a lovely picture of all of us pre-COVID uh, when we could be all close together like that. Uh, it's composed of K-12 higher education and non-profit uh, partners. So as I was saying, just a little bit more about Minnesota Goes to College before we dive in. So I'm sure that some of you have heard uh, the term College Knowledge Month uh, or College Goal Sunday. So those were initiatives that have been wrapped up and sort of rebranded into this umbrella term of Minnesota Goes to College. So all of those things still exist. We have College Knowledge Month, which just, which just ended, uh, where many institutions uh, waive application fees and a lot of high schools are helping their students apply to post-secondary ed or the military or to um, get into the workforce after high school. And then we do have the FAFSA and the DREAM Act events. Those happen uh, from October all the way until the school year starts, although the majority of them do happen in October, November, and December. Uh, and then finally, we do have something new in May, which was inspired by uh, former First Lady Michelle Obama's uh, college college uh, college signing day. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, um, college signing day, which we've called Decision Day. It's just to celebrate uh, our students' post -sec post secondary decisions, whether it's college, the workforce, uh, or the military. So that's a little bit about us. You can register your site on our website, which is uh, bit. We uh, slash MN goes to college. We can put that in the chat for you. Uh, some things that we can provide in terms of support are a newsletter, access to post-secondary community, resources for students and families, some in Spanish and in English, uh, training videos, and promotional materials. So we highly encourage you to participate. Uh, and we do have, obviously, some webinars. So this is one of them, the uh, Minnesota Dream Act training. And then we had a FAFSA training, which we had a, a little bit of technical issues with, so we're, we've rescheduled it on Zoom tomorrow. So if you're able to join us, it'll be the same presentation with Jeff Olson from Bethel, and it will be on Zoom. So we hope you can make it. And if not, we'll post the recording and distribute it for everyone. Uh, we have a lot of student support. So like, like I said just a little bit earlier, there's paying for college financial aid resources, a bunch of other things. Highly encourage you to check out the website. Uh, and if you have any questions at all, I'll put my email and Beth's email in the chat and you can reach out to us. Uh, and without further ado, I would like to hand the hand of the mic over to the lovely Megan Flores, who will tell us all about the Minnesota Dream Act. Thank you, Megan. Thanks, Kat. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us to learn a little bit more about the Minnesota Dream Act. Um, I have a presentation I'm going to share with you. Uh, I myself am a visual learner, and there are some kind of technical things, of course, when it comes to financial aid, which should be no shock to anyone. So I'll go ahead and start sharing my screen and get us started off. All right, Kat, can you go ahead and give me a thumbs up that you can see my screen? Okay, thank you. Um, as Kat mentioned, my name is Megan Flores and I work at the Minnesota Office of Higher Education uh, with our different state financial aid programs. Today, we're gonna specifically focus a little bit on the Minnesota DREAM Act process. Um, we like to encourage uh, folks in the kind of FAFSA DREAM Act sharing world to kind of use those terms interchangeably 
uh, there, because in our state, we do have two different ways you can apply for financial aid. I think the more commonly known one is the FAFSA process, which again, uh, Kat and Beth are coordinating a presentation tomorrow that we'll dive into a little bit deeper um, specs about the FAFSA process. Today, we're gonna focus on the Minnesota DREAM Act process. So today we'll discuss a little bit about undocumented students and the financial aid process, what the Minnesota DREAM Act is, how the application works, and then the kind of verification process for Minnesota DREAM Act students that's a little bit different than FAFSA students, and then the benefits for the program. So just kind of a, a kind of macro level overview nationally um, for the FAFSA is kind of the universal way to apply for financial aid for anyone who is a U.S. citizen, permanent resident or eligible non-citizen in the United States. However, when it comes to students who don't fall into one of those three buckets, it's a little bit across the board, depending on where the student resides. And so at this point in time, we do not have a federal DREAM Act or access to federal resources when it comes to financial aid for undocumented or documented youth. Um, we do have kind of a hodgepodge across the country, depending on where the student lives. I do want to make sure that everyone's aware that although undocumented students are not eligible to file the FAFSA uh, because they need to be either a U.S. citizen, permanent resident, or eligible non-citizen, if the student is a U.S. citizen, permanent resident, or eligible non-citizen, but their parent is undocumented, that student is indeed eligible for federal financial aid and should be filing a FAFSA. When it gets to the parent section, that student would just enter all zeros for the student's social security. It is important that those students file the FAFSA rather than the Minnesota DREAM Act because those students can get access to potentially the federal Pell Grant program, uh, federal work study, and then federal student loan programs. Across the US, again, depending on where you live, uh, if you are an undocumented student, your access is a little bit different. Um, in most states, you can apply to any public college or university, except for Alabama and South Carolina, which have prohibited that. And then there are three states who've specifically prohibited access for state financial aid in the US, and that's Arizona, Georgia, and Indiana. Uh, the more common is that a state will have its own version of a DREAM Act or a state residency requirement where they will change the statutory definition of who's a resident in their state. And that will then give the student access to state provided benefits such as in-state tuition rates, which would be the most common piece that we would see. There are seven states who have passed language that allows undocumented and in some cases documented youth to gain access to state financial aid programs, such as state gift aid or other state financial aid programs. Of those seven states, Minnesota is one. And so that's why we're having this conversation today about the Minnesota DREAM Act. Uh, in the statutory language, it is the Prosperity Act. It's more commonly known to students and families, as well as uh, helping folks at the high school or, or higher ed level as the DREAM Act. We are now in our ninth awarding cycle. Um, and really what our state did is we changed the definition of who's a resident in our state. Uh, in the Office of Higher Education, our mission really is to work with all students and to support all students in their pursuit and completion of a higher education credential. And that's regardless of their race, gender, or socioeconomic status. And we do believe strongly that having those opportunities, supporting those opportunities and investing in those opportunities makes our state as a whole more economically viable and also helps that individual's quality of life improve. And so for the Minnesota DREAM Act, it is centrally administered through the Office of Higher Education. That means that the eligibility and application happens from our office rather than at the campus level. And there's a variety of reasons that we decided to run that program this way. This gives you just a little bit of uh, some information about where their numbers are at for the Minnesota DREAM Act. Um, we do kind of see numbers flux a bit. And so we have many students who start the application process, but maybe don't complete the verification process or maybe don't end up enrolling. Uh, that's also common with FAFSA filing. So we do kind of see a similar trend there. We've also given you some information here just so you can kind of see what those median and average award amounts are. And that is for the Minnesota State Grant Program. 
So for the Minnesota Dream Act, uh, the language in the law requires that the student attends a Minnesota high school for at least three years, graduates from a Minnesota high school, or earns the GED in Minnesota, and that if they are males as assigned the sex at birth and they're age 18 to 25, that they register with the selective service. And then there is this other piece um, that was woven into the law that basically says if sometime there becomes a pathway to citizenship or to become an eligible non-citizen, that the student will pursue that option. But currently there isn't a federal process and so there isn't really anything we do to monitor this. As you'll notice, um, receiving DACA or Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals is not one of the requirements for the Minnesota DREAM Act language in the law. We have seen, um, and you'll probably hear a little bit more about this tomorrow, that with the FAFSA, there are some changes coming down the road. Some of the changes are happening already starting this eight year. Others will roll out in the coming years. Uh, one piece that passed just this past year in the Consolidated Appropriations Act was a provision to remove um, the drug eligibility piece in the FAFSA as well as selective service. And this is for federal student aid again. So this is FAFSA filing. And the feds did decide to early implement. So starting with the current aid year, 21-22, uh, registering with selective service for federal aid applicants isn't required. That, uh, that question still shows up in the FAFSA. It also will next year, this FAFSA that just opened October 2nd, because there wasn't enough time to make those changes and extract that language from the FAFSA. Um, but it's not monitored for FAFSA filers. For our Minnesota State Grant Program, selective service has never actually been required. However, when the DREAM Act was passed, that is when the first time we saw that language in statutory, and that was as a negotiation in order to get it to pass. Uh, at the time in 2013, uh, registration for selective service was added because at that time it was required at the federal level. Uh, Minnesota does have 10 different definitions or ways that a student can be considered a resident. And so the Minnesota DREAM Act is just one way. And that's the only way if the student meets only that way of meeting residency, they do have to do the selective service and comply with it. Again, if they're a male as identified at birth and ages 18 to 25. A little bit more kind of about that, because I know that's a little bit complicated. Um, an undocumented student could meet a different way of um, establishing residency. When the DREAM Act or the Prosperity Act passed, prior to that, all of our state residency definitions included the language be a US citizen or eligible non-resident. And when that language was stripped from the law, we have since consistently interpreted that a student, when the words appear residing, which most of the residency requirements do, um, that they need to be either legally residing or lawfully present at the time they establish residency. And so an example of being lawfully present is the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. And that's the most common example of someone being lawfully present in Minnesota that you'll hear. There are some other definitions of someone who's legally residing in Minnesota, but they're not a U.S. citizen or permanent resident, so they can't file the FAFSA. So that would include someone who's under something called temporary protective status or TPS, and that's most common for students who are whose country of origin or whose parents' country of origin is a country um, that ex experienced a natural disaster, so hurricanes, floods, things of that nature. TPS status, you'll see um, sometimes for students from El Salvador, Nicaragua, um, Haiti, those are kind of the more common places we've seen it. Another legally residing status would, of course, be a visa status or pending asylum. So students, once asylum is granted, they are eligible to file a FAFSA and are an eligible non-citizen. But the asylum status can take several years, sometimes five, six, seven, eight years. And so when the students in that in-between period waiting, they are legally residing in Minnesota. So if they graduate from a Minnesota high school while they're legally residing here, they are indeed a Minnesota resident for state financial aid purposes. So students who establish residency in the ways I've listed here on this slide, they don't have to register for selective service. It's not required. And so this is a new piece that's different from previous eight years that we are now working to incorporate into our 
um, practices as we interact with our applicants for the Minnesota DREAM Act program. So again, just to kind of reiterate, if the student is either legally residing or lawfully present at the time they graduate from Minnesota high school, so if they have DACA, if they're under TPS, if they're on a U visa and they graduate of Minnesota high school, that is the way they um, establish residency. They still use the Minnesota DREAM Act to apply, but they wouldn't have to apply, register for selective service. The other example is someone who let's say they maybe get um, DACA granted in their sophomore or junior year of high school. And then at the point in time that they um, graduate high school, maybe they don't go to school right away, but they stay living in Minnesota for 12 months and um, establish residency that way because they've lived here for 12 months. Or maybe they didn't graduate from Minnesota high school at all. Maybe they moved here from another state, but they are uh, registered and approved for DACA and they've lived here for 12 months. That person could also be a Minnesota resident. And then finally, if someone is residing under um, a legal, legal presence or a lawful present status for a year, and then they earn a GED, they would also be a Minnesota resident. Some details about the application process. Um, this is a state financial aid application, so it's only for Minnesota residents. So people who live in Minnesota would be doing this. It is an online application, but there are some pieces that are very different than the FAFSA process. Um, we do offer instructions both in English and Spanish. However, the student does have to complete it in one sitting. Unfortunately, our current technology doesn't support the student saving the application and coming back into it. However, if they make a mistake or would like an update to be made on their behalf, we at the Office of Higher Ed can definitely help with that. Uh, it is an annual application, so students do need to reapply annually. There is no FSA ID or federal student aid ID because, again, it's a state process. And so there is a different way to certify the signature. And then, of course, because it isn't a federal process, we don't have access to the IRS data, the Internal Revenue Service data, through the data retrieval tool option. Unlike the FAFSA, we do do 100% verification, and this most often helps the student because a lot of times they're not counting either family members they should be counting, or they're having trouble even figuring out what numbers to put into the, the application for the tax forms, and then we can help complete that on the back end. Uh, we have always accepted either the federal 1040 paperwork or the tax transcripts, they can do either one. Typically for a student, it's going to be easiest to get the 1040 instead of going through the process of ordering a tax transcript. Uh, and we also do take statement of non-filing or W-2s if that's the situation where the student's not a tax filer or their parent isn't one. Um, we do follow what the FAFSA does with prior prior year. So for the upcoming aid cycle that just opened last month, the 2022, 2023 financial aid year, we uh, take 2020 income information or we request that information. Uh, just like the FAFSA right now, we have two application cycles running. So right now we're currently in the 2021-2022 academic year. So current college students would be using this application if they're reapplying or maybe a student who's going to start middle of the year. If you have students who maybe worked with in previous years who graduated but now are mid-year applying, uh, or for students that are high school seniors, what they would be doing is the 22-23 application, which is for next year. So we'll keep both of those applications out there for the rest of this year. And then when it gets to late summer 2022, that's when we drop the 21-22 application from our website. But we do run both years simultaneously. The application does have both instructions as well as the individual questions in English as well as Spanish. And so on this slide, you can see kind of the instruction and welcome language that talks about, um, you know, who is a resident, what documents you want to gather as you get ready to do the application. If you select the Lea en Español, it converts all of the text on the page into Spanish if that's something that a student prefers. Again, the students do have to complete it in one sitting at this time. And so we want to make sure they have the information with them. These are all pretty much the same questions or information a student would gather if they were filing the FAFSA. We do try to make the process as closely aligned to the federal process as we can for things like having two aid years open at once, 
being available October 1st every year as an application. Um, following prior prior year for which year of income we're asking for for a student. The way we define um, who is a dependent versus independent student. All of those things are very similar for the Minnesota DREAM Act as they are for a FAFSA filer. This is just a little preview of a screenshot to give you an idea of how the questions look on the application. Uh, they can see both the English and the Spanish questions that have um, kind of some more information when you get into more of the income questions on the, on the uh, form. Uh, do have a, a little text box that opens so you can see kind of larger text that you can collapse or expand both in English and Spanish to show more information. We do also give the student the option if they do not have a social security number assigned to them or if they simply do not wish to provide one. Uh, we do have some data matching we do for renewal students where we can sync up their application from a previous year. Uh, as long as they're using or applying with the same first and last name that they used in the previous aid year. So for those of you who aren't really familiar with what is a dependent student versus an independent student, it's a pretty common question that we get uh, as students fill out either the FAFSA or the Minnesota DREAM Act application. And it is different for the Department of Education who they consider dependent versus independent versus the IRS. So the IRS definition of who can be a dependent on taxes is different than for financial aid purposes. For financial aid purposes, students are automatically considered independent if they're um, age 24 or older as of December 31st for that academic year. So each year, the application will ask, were you born on or before? And it gives a date. So for this year, that's January 1st, 1999. A student also is considered independent and therefore not needing to put their parent information on the application if they are a graduate or professional student, if the student is married, if they have legal dependents other than their spouse, uh, if they have, uh, excuse me, if they are a veteran of the U.S. Armed Forces or on active duty military, if they are orphan or ward of the court uh, or were in foster care at any time, age 13 or older, if they are a legal guardianship or emancipated minor, if they are considered an unaccompanied homeless youth, and then there may be some situations where a financial aid administrator um, might do what's called a dependency override, which is a form of professional judgment to determine based on that student's unique situation, they might be considered an independent student rather than a dependent student, and therefore would not need to um, provide parental information on the form. So for the purposes of the Minnesota DREAM Act, the Minnesota Office of Higher Education acts as the financial aid offices for most purposes. And that means we would be the entity that determines whether or not using professional judgment would be appropriate for things like a dependency override. And again, this is done, uh, the process we use is very similar to what a financial aid administrator would use on campus. And that is really trying to assess the student situation on an individual case-by-case -case basis. And when there are cases of non-voluntary severance in that parent-child relationship, because there's something like abuse or neglect happening, that that's when it would make sense to do a dependency override. It's not really a situation where if the student's parent just doesn't want to provide the information or if they just choose to not live with the parent because they don't like their roles, um, things like that probably wouldn't make sense to do the uh, dependency override. And so we follow what most campuses I believe do. It's pretty common that most campuses will just ask for a letter or documentation from a third party about that student situation. Um, we do get them sometimes from high school guidance counselors. We see them um, you know, from TRIO or Gear Up folks, Upward Bound, maybe somebody who's seeing that student in either a social work, mental health, or physical health capacity, someone who knows about the situation, um, not, not, not the student themselves or a family member. So once the student submits their application, again, has to be done online, is done all in one sitting, and is done annually. What happens is that the 
Um, Office of Higher Education then sends out some information to the student to request materials. We'll talk a little bit about that in a few moments here. But what it is we're asking for is that we do ask for a copy of the high school transcript. We provide students estimated awards. So we give them just kind of an idea of what their eligibility for the state grant program might be. Later, once they have a final transcript, or even just a copy of the diploma, they can then do that to get the final award. But just to get an estimated award, for example, um, you know, for students who are in the spring of their senior year, they of course wouldn't have a final transcript. So in the interim, they can turn in the transcripts that they have available to them. For tax filers, we do request signed copies of the 2020 Federal 1040 Income Tax Returns. And if they're a um, non-filer, we ask for either W-2s or if that's not available to them, then we do um, take statements of earnings. Uh, if the student happens to be a family where maybe the prior prior tax year forms are from another country or the parent on the application uh, still resides in another country but files taxes there, we do work with foreign returns if that's appropriate. And then we do request from students if they want to be considered for work study uh, that they would then supply a copy of their work authorization card. And that lets the campus know that that student is interested in work study and that they are authorized to work. Again, a little bit we mentioned earlier on about selective service. This is only again required for students if the only way they meet the residency definition is by the Minnesota DREAM Act way of establishing residency. It's for males as identified at birth and ages 18 to 25. If a student does have a social security number, they can register online. If they do not, then they would need to do a paper process to comply with that requirement to register for selective service. And that does have to have what's called a wet or an ink signature. Unfortunately, we can't accept those scanned, emailed, faxed. So it is something where we ask them to first send it to the Office of Higher Ed via traditional mail so that we can track the fact that it's been done and move forward with processing their DREAM Act application. And then on their behalf, we go ahead and forward in the form to the Selective Service Registration Office. That form they're very picky about. It does have to be completed in all capital letters and using black ink. So after the student has completed the verification process, we do um, send out, uh, actually to back up, as soon as the student submits their application for the Minnesota DREAM Act, right away after we send them an email script, letting them know they took the first step, they submitted their application, here's what you need to do for verification. And that's when we have the script to describe to them how to turn the high school transcript, the tax forms, and then registration with selective service if applicable. And so that's auto delivered to the student right away. Um, it does instruct them that the vast majority, again, except for that paper selective service form can be sent. We have a designated Minnesota Dream Act email account, which is the account that that auto delivered um, application received notice comes from. So they can just hit reply and attach their documents to that. Kind of as far as the process, we do, as I mentioned, issue estimated awards for the Minnesota State Grant. That process takes part in the spring. And then over the summer, once the student has turned in their final high school transcript or diploma, that is when we start kicking off those final award notices. The timing of that really does depend on the legislative cycle and if the session ends timely in May or if we end up with a special session that carries into June. Uh, the way that we work the notification is that we can only process a state grant estimate or a state grant award for one school at a time. And so we go by the very first school or the first choice school that the student lists on their application. The student can list multiple applications and we can give them different scenarios if they work with us on that, but we always can only run one school at a time. Another thing to note, the email address we use is the email that they put on the application. So we don't send pretty much anything via paper mail. Everything's done via email to the email address on file. So if you're working with students uh, who are using, for example, a high school account and your high school cuts off those accounts a certain amount of time after graduation, you'll just want to coach that student to maybe use 
um, you know, their Gmail or their Hotmail or their Comcast or whatever other email they have, because that might have a little bit more longevity to it. We do have an administrator portal. And so schools, the different colleges and universities in Minnesota have access to that online secure information so that they can see the student's application. They're only able to see it if the student lists that school on their application. So the Minnesota Dream Act application is very similar to the FAFSA and it has those drop down boxes where it lists the different schools and a student can select up to 10. Uh, those other campuses then that the student lists, they do have access to see the data elements. Uh, we use the same needs analysis as the federal government uses for awarding federal student aid and as the institutions most often use for deciding about their own need-based financial aid programs. And so we work collaboratively with our campus partners to inform them of this program, as well as our needs analysis logic, so that ideally they're incorporating our estimated state grant along with what they know about institutional aid, whether it's a scholarship or a grant, and then kind of building in a comprehensive award offer that comes from the school directly as well. So some of the benefits of doing the Minnesota DREAM Act application. Uh, the DREAM Act, again, is the way for our state residents who cannot file a FAFSA, but are indeed residents to apply for state financial aid. So pretty much any state financial aid program, unless it only allows FAFSA filers, which most of ours don't, um, the student then has access to by filing the Minnesota DREAM Act application. I've listed the most common programs we work with here on the slide, and I'll talk about a few of them. We do participate in, uh, or the one benefit, excuse me, is reduced tuition rates. And that might just be because they're being um, uh, recognized and accepted as a resident. So in-state tuition rates is a really big benefit for students who are, for example, attending the U of M. There's quite a bit of a cost difference for an out-of-state student versus a resident student. And then there are several Minnesota state schools that no longer charge a resident versus non-resident rate. But for those who do, doing the Minnesota Dream Act application gets that student access to those resident rates. And then we do have agreements signed with several neighboring states for tuition reciprocity. And for those agreements, the state of residence determines whether or not a student can be included in that program. So for our students, Minnesota Dream Act students can participate in tuition reciprocity where they additionally get a discounted benefit at public colleges in North Dakota, South Dakota, Wisconsin, and then in the Canadian province of Manitoba. And then we have one community college in Iowa that participates. The Minnesota State Grant Program is probably the, the more widely known benefit to the Minnesota DREAM Act application. This is a need-based program. It's our state's primary uh, need-based program that we have. This formula for it does take into account the Pell Grant, which unfortunately DREAM Act students aren't eligible for. And so that does have uh, uh, definitely an influence on the award amount, but it is a grant program. So it's gift aid, doesn't need to be repaid. Uh, the student can only use it in the state of Minnesota, so it's not portable outside of the state of Minnesota. And then you can receive this benefit for up to the equivalent of four full-time academic years or eight semesters, eight full-time semesters. And then students, again, regardless of if they file a FAFSA or the DREAM Act, they can't be in default on student loans or delinquent on child support and must be making satisfactory academic progress. This chart here gives you kind of an idea for a student with a zero EFC, which of course not all FAFSA filers or Minnesota Dream Act filers have a zero EFC, but it kind of gives you an idea of what the benefit might be uh, if the student was attending either the U of M or a private institution, kind of the average grant at uh, a state school, it's a four-year university or a two-year uh, community college in our state. And you can tell here from just glancing at the chart, um, there is an incentive or a larger grant award eligibility, the higher the credit level the student takes. And our grant program at our, for our state does cap out at 15 credits. So whether they take 15, 16, 18, or 20, the grant is the same amount. And then it does interplay with the Pell Grant, which is a little bit more complicated than we probably wanna get in 
on this call, but that's why sometimes you do see these little jumps where at a certain credit level or enrollment level that maybe a student, uh, their Pell is higher, so their state grant goes down or maybe even is zero. And that has to do with that interplay in the formula. I did throw into the chat um, before uh, the presentation started. I have a, a longer, more helpful uh, PDF that if we have time, we can go through. But I just want to call that out too. It gives you a better idea, I think, for students, uh, you know, regardless of what we call the needs analysis, if it's expected family contribution or student index or whatever we call it, I think most families uh, probably more readily can identify it or it's more accessible to talk about adjusted gross income. Income, excuse me. And so the uh, handout that I put in the chat has a list by income and family size to give a student an idea about what their Pell Grant and their state grant might be, which again would hopefully incentivize them to file the FAFSA or the Minnesota Dream Act. Another gift aid program we have is the Minnesota Child Care Grant Program, uh, which again, Minnesota Dream Act students are eligible for. This is a grant uh, which does have a separate application. It's a campus-based program that is administered at the school level. And it's for students who have children who need some childcare while the student's attending school. Uh, we did have some recent changes to this program just this past legislative session. And so the grant now goes up to 6,500 and it is tied to that expected family contribution. Again, it can only be used at Minnesota schools, um, at participating schools, which not all do. We do have a list on our website of the schools that participate. Um, and it is gift aid, so it doesn't have to be repaid. This program, the student can receive the grant uh, until they receive the grant equivalent of five full-time academic years. And so this one isn't looking at attendance and capping the eligibility at that. It's looking at receipt of the actual grant. Again, can't be in default on a federal student loan and must be making satisfactory academic progress. The work study program is a program that's somewhat unique to Minnesota. Not all states have their own state-sponsored work study. It's just the federal program and then that's it. Um, we're fortunate that we do have a state work study program. We do have some of our campus partners that do reserve some state work study funds specifically for Minnesota DREAM Act students since they can't award those students federal work study dollars. Uh, the student does have to have work authorization, um, which a student who has a uh, you know, asylum status pending likely would have access to work a work permit. So would probably a student with TPS as well as a student who has DACA granted. Um, and the student can, uh, you know, continue to use this up until their work authorization authorization expires or if they're able to renew it and they renew it, then they could continue that work. This is awarded at the school level. And so it would be the college or university that would determine whether or not to offer work study to a student. So if you're working with students, it's a good idea for them to make sure they let their school know they're interested in this program. The Minnesota South Loan actually has always been open to undocumented students in our state. We've never had a requirement that looks at citizenship. We have international students as well. Uh, there aren't any immigration requirements uh, for borrowers. However, all borrowers do have to have a co-signer. And so sometimes, that can definitely be a barrier for students who would be Minnesota DREAM Act filers, um, but that that because that co-signer does have to be a U.S. citizen or permanent resident, and they do have to reside in the United States. Um, but this application is available online, and again, it is open um, for the online process if the student does have a social security number assigned to them, or if they don't, we do have paper applications available for students. A few things just to think about before we kind of pause and see if there's any questions in the chat or if anyone uh, wants to unmute their mic, mic, excuse me, and ask a question. Is it, it's very common, very typical. The Minnesota State Grant Program, unfortunately, does not cover tuition and fees. So it does help reduce the cost or bring that cost to a level, hopefully, where a student might be able to work out a payment plan or maybe has some other institutional gift aid or private scholarship aid offered to them. Uh, it also is something to note that at some enrollment levels, unfortunately, because we're required to back out that federal Pell Grant, even though the student does not currently have access to that, 
that at some enrollment levels, unfortunately, students do not have eligibility, that eligibility is at zero. There are um, more and more private institutions, public institutions, and nonprofit or philanthropic organizations that do have scholarships available to students who are undocumented and documented or otherwise documented. And so these students um, definitely do have some options. Uh, it's really important that students are you know, contacting uh, the school directly for school specific opportunities. We do have some resources on our website, but we don't always find out if there are changes to those programs or to those outside scholarship opportunities. So I just wanna pause right now for a moment just to check in with Kat and Beth um, and the rest of you. I know that was a lot of information that I kind of threw at you all at once, but I wanna just check and see if there's any questions. Um, sure, Megan, can you hear me okay? Yep, I can hear you. Awesome, I joined by my phones <laughs> also. Um, we do have a couple questions in the chat. Um, one was, can students use the DREAM Act aid for longer than eight semesters if they study part-time? Oops, you're muted. You're muted, Megan, sorry. Megan. Megan, sorry, somehow you're muted. Oh, I don't know what's going on, hold on. Okay, you're unmuted now. No, it's not. <laughs> Can you? There you go. Yes, yeah, sorry, you must have muted me. That's weird. Okay, sorry. I was That's trying okay. to unmute you. Uh, it happens. So okay. for the limit on post-secondary attendance, it's actually the equivalent of eight full-time semesters. So if a student is attending part-time, that part-time term does not count as heavily as a full-time term. And so if you were attending eight semesters, but you weren't full-time each of those terms, then yes, definitely that eligibility would extend, extend beyond that. And I should mention that's also true for FAFSA filers that limit on the state grant program. The program itself, the state grant program is one program. We have just two different ways in our state to apply for that program, the FAFSA and the Minnesota Dream Act, but it is one program. So, you know, 99% of the, the program's um, operating features are the same, whether you file a FAFSA or a Dream Act, it's just a different application to get the benefit. All right, <clears throat> thank you, Megan. Uh, yep. the, next, the next question comes from Javier and he's asking, uh, can students, does student, can students who do like summer classes in Minnesota get the DREAM Act and how does that work? Yes, students who attend during the summer can get the Minnesota State Grant. Um, so again, the DREAM Act is the application. The benefit is the state grant. And so the state grant program is open to both FAFSA filers as well as Minnesota DREAM Act applicants uh, all year round, so fall, spring, summer, if they're going to a quarter school, it's available every quarter. Um, the attendance does count so that it's, it behooves the student to definitely apply. Most schools, as well as for the, the Office of Higher Ed process for DREAM Act, don't automatically package for summer because most students, they don't decide they're going to attend summer until a little bit later in the academic year once they see what courses are offered. Because really for summer, it's kind of course offering determines whether or not a student um, takes classes, um, also probably work, what they're doing for the summer as far, far as work or maybe internships. Um, but definitely the student can receive the Minnesota state grant funds over the summer. Uh, if they're a DREAM Act filer, what they would want to do is just let the Office of Higher Education know. So they'd want to send an email to the Minnesota DREAM Act email, which I have at the end of my presentation. And then let us know what school they plan to attend if it's different than where they attended during the academic year. And then also what credit level they're taking. We can even just give them estimates or ideas, even if they're not registered or they're not enrolled, they just wanna know, hey, if I took summer, how much would I get if I took eight credits? Cause they just wanna have an idea. That's something we're more than happy to do. 
Awesome. Thank you, Megan. Uh, <laughs> another question from Javier is any data about how many new DACA applicants we have in the state of Minnesota? How many renewal DACA applicants? How many new DACA? New we DACA. don't track new versus renewal. Um, the USCIS does have statistics publicly available on their website for every single state in the country for new versus renewal. We do track um, the number of DACA recipients or, or people who uh, have DACA who also apply for the Minnesota Dream Act, but they're not required to tell us that they have DACA. Um, and we have used that information or have had some requests from the Attorney General's office. We're actually currently working right now um, in collaboration with the Attorney General office here in Minnesota for the case in Texas regarding the rescission of the DACA program. And so we do sometimes work with them uh, to supply some of that. It's all you know cumulative data, so we're not disclosing any private student data. We're never asked for that kind of thing. It's just um, difficult oftentimes to determine the number of undocumented persons in the United States or specifically in each state. So there are things like um, DACA applications that might be used as a proxy. Thanks again, Megan. And for the folks who are asking these questions, if, if Megan didn't quite get what you were uh, asking, you can go ahead and just put another question as a follow-up in the chat. Uh, but for now, we will move on to the next question, which is, what if a student wants to go to college outside of Minnesota? What measures are in place for them to get scholarships or grants? Um, so when we started out the presentation, we talked a little bit about the landscape for undocumented students in the United States. And unfortunately, it isn't um, a path that's clearly defined for students because it is a state by state situation. Most states, in order to get access to in-state tuition, that student needs to be a resident of that state, which means there are how many different states, how many different definitions. And so typically for a Minnesota person who is graduating from one of our high schools, they're not going to be a resident in another state unless they move there and somehow establish residency. And then that state, by the way, there are only seven who give gift aid through the state financial aid process. That's how they could get access to state dollars. Um, but unfortunately, you know, if a student, we do have reciprocity, as I mentioned, so that's an option as far as reduced tuition rates. But as far as state funded money, there are only seven states that give state funded money uh, to undocumented and documented youth. And there are, um, in those other states, they're not giving state money at all. As far as private scholarships or private foundations, um, national organizations, things of that nature. Um, the way I always like to explain that is they all fall under the golden rule, which is whoever has the gold makes the rules. And so whoever's money it is, they determine who it goes to, where it goes to, and under what situations the student can use that scholarship. And so if a student has been awarded a scholarship from a private organization, uh, it's a really good idea for them to understand where can it be used. Is it only for a Minnesota school? Is it for any school in the country? Those kinds of details can be really important. So I hope that answered the question. If not, please feel free to clarify or ask a follow-up. Yep, absolutely. And then this is another question just asking to clarify the Minnesota State Grant. Uh, could you just say a little bit more about what it covers? So for our Minnesota State Grant Program, it is um, paid directly to the school. So that's kind of something important to bring up. So again, whether you're a FAFSA filer or Minnesota Dream Act applicant, those are the ways you apply to get the grant. The grant program in itself is the same, regardless of which avenue you use to apply. The grant is dispersed directly to the college or university that the student attends, and then those dollars are applied to the student's account. So that's how most forms of financial aid work. The money goes to the school, and then the school applies it to the student's account. And so the student's account kind of works kind of sort of a little bit like a checking account where there's credits and debits on the account. And so, um, you know, depending on if they're charged tuition fees, maybe if they have an on-campus bookstore account or buy materials through the school, or if there's course specific 
kinds of charges. That's kind of how the billing statement works. Um, you know, if they're living on campus and they have a room and board plan or a, a contract uh, for on-campus housing, then they would see those charges. Those are all going to be on the student bill. The financial aid then just comes in to offset it. And so in the case of the state grant, typically it's helping to go towards that tuition cost. It's reducing the amount of the balance due. It's bringing down the balance due. And so it's just applied directly to the count. Um, we don't necessarily earmark it and say, this must be paid for um, you know, tuition only. We do, you know, if, if we had a case where a student had enough gift aid that the tuition and fees were covered, then they'd probably be working a little bit closer with their school to see what impact that might have. Um, a lot of sources of financial aid can apply towards books, they can apply towards living expenses, transportation, things like that. It just depends on the source of the aid. Thank you, Megan. Yeah, you're welcome. Are there any other questions? Yep, we've got we've got about three or four more. No worries, not a problem at all. Okay, next question is, uh, does the private scholarship on uh, studentsunited.org still exist? The page says that it cannot be found. Um, that I can take a note of and check. Studentsunited.org is, I believe, a Min State student-led organization. So each year they um, elect a new student to be in charge of that. So it might be that that contact has since switched over for us um, and maybe their website or their URL hasn't been updated, but I can check that. Okay, great. Uh, <laughs> and then, uh, if you could just go over a little bit more about work study qualifications again, it says that this person missed just a few of the details. Yeah, not a problem at all. And so work study is something where it's a campus based program. Work study generally comes into three different pots. There's a federal pot of money called work study. There's a state pot called Minnesota State Work Study. And then some institutions have their own work study pot of money or resources. Uh, the federal work study program, you have to be a FAFSA filer to get access to. Uh, for the Minnesota State Work Study, program that can be awarded to DREAM Act or FAFSA filers, either one is fine. Uh, the student does have to have work authorization. And so that would be the, mean that the student has a work permit and they're authorized to work in the United States. Um, both for federal, state and institutional work study, the packaging of that award happens at the campus level. And so the financial aid office is determining who would get access to those funds and how. We do know that if students um, are applying for financial aid via the Minnesota DREAM Act application, if they send us a copy of their work permit, the school has access to see that the student has that authorization to work in the US through our secure online portal. Again, if the student is listing that school on their Minnesota DREAM Act application. And so that's kind of an indicator to the school that the student is interested in work study. Um, but most campuses have a campus defined process. And so uh, it might be handled through the student employment office. It could potentially be handled through the financial aid office. It varies a little bit from campus to campus because it is a school based program. I'm trying to think if there were other questions about work study. Um, I should mention, I guess, with work study, it comes up sometime, uh, sometimes, often, you know, kind of a it's kind of a weird financial aid program in that you are you're awarded an opportunity to work, but it doesn't mean you're guaranteed those dollars on the award notification or the award offer. It just lets the student know about the eligibility, and then the student does have to actually get the on-campus job. So it isn't something where if you see on a work, you know, on a award offer, a thousand dollar work study. It doesn't mean the students guaranteed that $1,000. It doesn't mean that $1,000 transfers to the student account to help pay for the college experience. The student still has to get the job and then work the hours and then they're paid as they earn. All right, uh, thank you, Megan. And then it looks yeah. like we have one last question. Uh, how should students who have a work permit through TPS, Asylum, or DACA and reside, and reside in Minnesota get charged for their courses? Would it be in-state tuition price or non-resident price? I can read it again if you want me to. Yeah, so um, 
those pieces about the documentation you're listing, um, it's what has to do with if you get access to in-state or out-of-state tuition is that you are a resident student. So if a student meets one of the 10 residency definitions, they are an in, a resident student and they should be charged in-state tuition. Um, it does get a little bit complicated, I realize that, because we don't have one universal definition of who's a resident in our state. Our law is pretty inclusive in that we do have 10 different ways. Um, the student doesn't have to know the way in which they are you know, granted residency. Um, when they file the FAFSA, the residency determination is made at the campus level. When they file the Minnesota Dream Act, the Office of Higher Education determines residency. And some of that has to do with that documentation we collect after they've applied. Um, but any student you know, who graduates from a Minnesota high school uh, while lawfully residing in Minnesota, so whether they're under those three statuses you named, Kat, those students would be residents and should be charged in-state resident tuition at campuses that, that charge a differential rate. Okay, are there, do you have more? Uh, I do have questions? just a couple more slides in case people's thoughts are kind of just processing and something else comes up in the chat. I just okay. wanted to make sure um, that folks are aware of just some resources we have on our website. Um, we do realize that there are, of course, uh, several other um, organizations. We don't have a comprehensive list. Unfortunately, we do have a partial list and it, and, and it does need some work definitely. Um, things have kind of changed in and out with some of these organizations. We do also have a couple of resources. We, of course, are not lawyers. I'm not a lawyer, disclaimer. Um, I can't provide immigration or legal information um, related to how to navigate things like change in status and things like that. But we do have a really excellent partner in the Immigrant Legal Resource Center and the Immigrant Law Center of Minnesota that do a lot of um, screening. They have open phone lines that help uh, pro bono give legal work as well as help get folks connected with a lawyer if that's appropriate and help with DACA renewal. We also do have some folks um, at the Mexican as well at the Ecuador and consulate that will help with things, community affairs folks assigned. And then the, the Navigate organization, which is now Unidos Minnesota, which I realized I forgot to update on here. Uh, we do have a partnership in, or a community ally in Jose Avilar who helps with youth and he um, also helps with some opportunities that they know about related to scholarships. And um, I believe they keep a newsletter going. They've had some um, internships that they've helped students with as well. And then also wanna make sure that folks are aware of um, just different places uh, that they can contact uh, for free tax help um, students who don't have a social security number or their parents can still indeed file taxes and oftentimes are eligible for tax credits. Uh, there's a community nonprofit called Prepare Plus Prosper um, that does free tax prep. This is true for FAFSA filers as well. So any kind of students you have um, who might be falling into state grant or Pell Grant range would likely qualify for these free services. Prepare Plus Prosper does also help folks apply for what's called an individual taxpayer identification number or an ITIN, which can be used in place of a social security number when filing taxes. And then we, as the Office of Higher Ed, are always available to help Minnesota Dream Act applicants or anyone in you know, the guidance and career and access space that has questions about the Dream Act or questions. We do have a, a queue line that's answered uh, Monday through Friday from 8 to 4.30, and we have several folks that answer that phone and can help answer questions related to the DREAM Act. I have the email there on the slide. That is where communication about the DREAM Act application comes from when we send an acknowledgement to the student or request materials. That's also the email address that all materials should be sent to if students are sending things via email. Um, we have multiple people who can help monitor that email address and help process the documentation we receive. Um, at this point in time, um, I can help with Spanish 
So if we have students or parents who prefer to interact either via email or on the phone via Spanish, then I can help with that. If there's another language need, we can arrange for translation services and cover that cost for the student or the family. Uh, and that is about all of the information I have. Um, are there any other questions, Kat or um, Beth, that came up in the chat that you want to call out or any closing remarks that you wanted to make? We have a couple other questions, Megan. Okay. So we have, um, can folks request additional training on their specific campuses? If so, how can they uh, submit those requests? Um, I believe we have a request to presenter that we can throw into the chat. Do If you can grab that link, Kat. Mm -hmm. um, we do have an opportunity where if you want to let us know a little bit more about your event, um, timing, planning, numbers, materials, what you're exactly looking for, we do have some contractors that the Office of Higher Education has where we can help facilitate those community events, uh, you know, whether they're, you know, at a high school or maybe at a church or a community center or wherever out in the community they are that you're gathering students who want to hear more about uh, the different programs that we have. We definitely can help facilitate um, helping to provide some supports for that. Yep, absolutely. And the next question is, who would I be able to contact to fix the residency status? I have a few students I know who graduated here in Minnesota and were charged non-residency prices for their first semester. Um, that would be something, so the billing happens at the campus level. So it would be the campus that the student would need to work with. And my guess is going to be student accounts um, or the billing office to find out why they were charged the wrong tuition. I would definitely say if it's for this current fall, it's not too late to correct an error. It's, it, it might just be that they're not aware the student is a resident for some reason. Um, if it is something, one thing that I guess I didn't specifically mention, but both, that I should call out just given that this came up, is that both for the FAFSA as well as the Minnesota DREAM Act, our state grant re program requires that the application is received by the 30th day of the term. It is on that very first screen when a student goes to fill out the application in bold and in red, but whether you file a FAFSA or whether you file a Minnesota DREAM Act, that application has to be received by the 30th day of the term in order to be considered for the Minnesota State Grant Program. As far as resident tuition, that's a little bit more on a per campus level, but it sounds like probably in a handful of students' cases, it's just that they were not coded correctly as residents when they should be. So I definitely say to work with the campus directly to get that corrected. Okay, and then this is our last question is, can you talk about the ITIN number and how this can help students to open a bank account and file their taxes? So the ITIN number or the individual taxpayer identification number is a process that's actually through the IRS to help someone establish a unique, a unique identifier for that individual person. It isn't a social security number and it doesn't grant any benefits um, that are related to, uh, for example, citizenship or work eligibility or anything of that nature. It merely allows someone who does not have a social security number to instead file taxes. And so um, long before um, DACA and things of that nature, um, more specifically DACA, that allowed access for undocu certain undocumented individuals to gain access to um, work authorization, folks have been filing taxes for a long time with ITIN numbers. It's not a new thing. It's something the IRS has had around for decades. And it just, because they're aware that there are um, unauthorized individuals working who can file taxes and who are paying taxes. And so it's a way for those individuals to file taxes. And in fact, some iterations of a federal dream uh, Dream Act legislation, which has been proposed about 12 different varieties or versions of it, but many of them do, you'll often hear um, sometimes these words like, um, you know, demonstrate good moral character, which is kind of subjective, but that sometimes can be tied to things like if you were in a earning threshold where you should be filing taxes, were you doing that? And so some versions of the Federal DREAM Act 
have used that good moral character test as were you filing taxes and paying into the system if you needed to. And the I-10 process opens that window for those families or individuals to get that individual taxpayer identification number and then be able to later at some point hopefully demonstrate I, you know, when they apply for this pathway to citizenship that all along the way I have been filing my taxes as I was supposed to. So that's one benefit. Um, we do also right around uh, when the DACA program came out, we had a lot of folks who had an ITIN and there's a process to convert the ITIN into an SSN. If you maybe were in a situation or, or a status where you didn't have a social security number, but then later uh, had an adjustment of status through the immigration process or became eligible for a new program and then were assigned to social security, you wanna make sure that that tax record traces through. So there is a process through um, the IRS, which I'm sure Prepare Plus Prosper is aware of and could help with to make sure that that tax record seamlessly transfers again, related to this good moral character test. So that's definitely some benefits I'm aware of. As far as the bank piece, um, I do know that oftentimes um, undocumented folks have issues, uh, especially now that we've unfortunately uh, fallen into a situation again in Minnesota where uh, getting access to a driver's license, there's some barriers there right now. And so um, oftentimes a bank wants proof of identity, um, a photo ID, um, depending on the lending institution or the purpose of the bank. If for that individual, they, they might take a student ID, they might take a work ID card along with other two or three other forms of identification, but it can be real challenging for folks without an SSN to establish banking history. And so um, some lending or banking institutions, um, more predominantly probably credit unions, are going to have more accessible policies where someone with an ITIN could open up a bank account and have, you know, uh, use that as a method to be able to um, have access. So those are the benefits I'm aware of, but you know there may be others. Uh, and maybe you know, maybe Javier could unmute himself because this is I'm not sure if this is a statement or a question. You put in the chat colleges and universities make the 1098T tax form. Hey, Javier. Uh, this is needed to apply for the ITIN. So if you have any questions for Megan, go ahead. I encourage you to un unmute. Can you unmute yourself? Yeah. Can you guys okay. hear me? Yep. Mm -hmm. um, the ITIN, this is one of those uh, questions that we get a lot in college. My name is Javier from Normandale Community College. Uh, many of the students, they ask me, what do I need to be able to get the IT number? Usually, they will need a document from college that established that they pay money and they pay mm -hmm. taxes. So that would be that form, the 1098T tax form. Um, can you tell us, uh, Megan, um, sometimes the students, they don't know how to use this because this form is embedded into our data. So students, they really need to figure it out what that is. Is there something that they can go to your website to learn more about taxes, especially IT and this type of forms? Um, well, we're not actually a tax organization, so we can't give tax information. We can give information, but we can't provide guidance on the tax process. And so it is something where, of course, we're aware of the ITIN and the abilities of the ITIN. The 1098T process is a campus-based process um, that uh, is required by laws outside of financial aid. Um, and regulations outside of financial aid. And so it's not something that we're, you know, per se involved with, we're aware of it, of course. Um, uh, but with the, the 1098T thing, I think we could probably see if there'd be a way within Minnesota State or even, um, you know, reaching out to another agency, the Minnesota Department of Revenue, um, to see what kind of resources or maybe tutorials, or maybe if there is an infographic or something like that, because it sounds like what we're looking for is just more information that's clearly worded so students understand the process. So if you wanna maybe have Eris send a follow-up either to me or to Kat or Beth about like a two, three questions, what are students asking? What do they need? What would be helpful? We can probably kind of brainstorm and collaborate on what kind of resource could be available. Um, 
you know, as long as it's just information we're putting out there, but we can't help people do taxes or file taxes. There's just that little bit of a limitation there. Definitely, I'll follow up with you. And this is very important for our kids because once they are able to do taxes, once they apply to colleges for a scholarship, we look at the economic background. So mm -hmm. having those taxes is a huge thing. Unfortunately, many students will take a couple of years to figure out that piece when we can do a lot of work. So I will follow up with you. Thank you, Megan. Yeah, definitely. Happy to help. Are there any other questions, Kat, that came up? So I don't see any in the chat. Speak now or forever hold your peace. Well, and then the other piece, or not hold your peace forever, just hold it until you think of the question. <laughs> um, so, you know, I think sometimes when we go to a training like this or we have professional development opportunities, um, a day later, two days later, a week from then, we have kind of these light bulb moments or we start to see some connections. Maybe when we go back to our respective offices and collaborate with colleagues or we think of a, a student situation that we just didn't in that moment. So do feel free to, you know, to reach out and be connected. I do think that um, you know, for example, this great thing that Javier brought up about the 1098T and the ITIN and students just not really understanding that process or having, um, you know, good information that says you need to do this and here's why. I think sometimes we learn about those things in these formats and that's where that collaborative effort really can make better outcomes for students. And so, you know, as you go back to your respective organizations and do some of that work, please, you know, feel free to be in touch with us and let us know we do appreciate the feedback. Um, I know I we don't always have that direct connect, connections with students in the same ways you do. And we want students to be connecting with who they feel com comfortable connecting with in ways that they feel comfortable connecting. And that you know, most often is gonna prove for the best outcome for the students. So if there's things behind the scenes we can do to facilitate the resources or the gathering or the information, uh, you know, we're happy to do that. 